Take your Bibles with me and turn to Luke chapter 19. I sent out the message outline via email. It's also on our website and it's also available in a YouTube link below this video. Luke chapter 19, we're near the end of the chapter. It's pretty exciting stuff in this section. We just finished the longest section of Luke. If you have that outline in front of you, you might turn it over or look to the side there where it lists our overall series. We are all the way near the bottom. We've gone past that journey to Jerusalem phase, that rejection phase, and we're entering into that reception time when Jesus finally actually gets to Jerusalem. And so we just have a couple teaching times over the next few weeks in this section, and then we get into the death, burial, and the resurrection, which we got a little bit of a preview with we, uh, at Easter. We jumped ahead, and we jumped back, and we're going to get there again in a few weeks. And this is that famous triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In all this time, Jesus has been hinting that he's the Messiah, or he's been telling his disciples, hey, I'm revealing myself to you, but let's wait, and it's not time yet. It's my timing, my plan. Now that's, that's all done. Jesus is announcing loud and clear he's the promised and expected Messiah. And each of the Gospels record this particular transition. And in the feeding of the five thousands, uh, feeding of the thousands, excuse me, uh, G that, that's recorded in all the Gospels. But in this case, this is the second event that is recorded in all the Gospels up to this point. You understand what I mean? And so it's really important because all the gospel writers mention it. And so this is section is really an extended call to praise Jesus. And there's a compassionate but very sad warning at the end of this section to choose wisely in how we respond to Jesus. So let's look together. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 28, just a small section of the gospel of Luke. The whole section, we praise Jesus as the promised Messiah, but in this first part of it, we celebrate God's predicted plan in Jesus. And, and, and we use the word in there very, very clearly, not through Jesus, as if the plan is more important than Jesus, but it's actually in Jesus. Jesus is God's perfect plan and his predicted plan. It centers around the person of Jesus. So let's look, verse 28. After Jesus has said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. So he's finally getting ready to enter into Jerusalem after this long journey south. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, think just to the east of Jerusalem, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. So a young donkey, think that. And untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, say, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it out, found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And I put on your outlines this, we present Jesus as the coming Messiah as the prophetic Messiah, and we see all these preparations where the disciples are involved in presenting Jesus as the promised Messiah. And you think, well, when you look at this and you think, well, that's kind of weird. Is Jesus sending these guys ahead to steal a donkey? No, no, probably the arrangements were made in advance, but at the, at the least, Jesus has orchestrated this whole scenario, this whole scene, and it's very obvious that he is taking these steps to show he's the promised Messiah. And most likely, he had already arranged and people had arranged for people to ride on donkeys and, and colts. And, and in this case, in Matthew, we see that donkey, think young donkey, came with mama too, but Luke just records young donkey that hadn't ridden before. So it'd be kind of challenging, especially when the crowd comes later, another sign of Jesus as the Messiah that's unstated, but kind of built into the text. So probably a previous arrangement with the owners of the colt, a young male donkey, with mama donkey, as Matthew mentions, and in and, and the ancient world, if you think of a ruler riding on a donkey, you think peace. When you think of a warrior on a horse, you think war. So Jesus here, colt, donkey, 
peace and grace, right? He's coming now, and he comes in peace. When you look later in the Bible, like the horses of Revelation warn judgment later. So very very much a contrast that Jesus wants us to catch. And he's very much on purpose fulfilling the words of Zechariah from hundreds of years earlier in Zechariah 9, where Zechariah says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. That's a poetic and nice name for Jerusalem. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is legitimate and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey. On a young donkey, the foal of a female donkey. And so Jesus orchestrates this whole scene, and his disciples notice they're involved. And Jesus is saying, okay, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, and go get it. And then the owners say, of course, yes, take it, it's for the Lord. And everything's just orchestrated and laid out. Jesus is laying it all out. He's very clearly presenting himself as the promised, the prophetic, the coming Messiah. He's showing up and loudly declaring that he comes in peace, he comes with compassion, he comes with grace. Verse 36, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. So they put some of their cloaks on the donkey to make it more comfortable for Jesus to ride. Now they actually put some of their clothes, their outer clothes, on the road for him. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, so think a hill to the east of Jerusalem and heading down, they're going to go back up into Jerusalem. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And then they, they shout these things, which are direct quotes. The first one from Psalm 13 and Psalm 118. And then the next quote, it looks suspiciously like, or at least tied to, Luke chapter 2 and the announcement of Jesus' birth. So they sing this, bless it, and they shout this, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's from Psalm 13 and Psalm 118. And then peace in heaven and glory in the highest, which is very similar to what the angels announced in the birth announcement of Jesus. And so you notice these cloaks here, and I put I put in your outlines first, we present Jesus as the coming Messiah. Here we praise Jesus as the confirmed king. So the disciples are involved in getting ready, presenting him. And then when Jesus comes in the city and he's getting ready to go in the city, the, the people are laying down their cloaks and the disciples are orchestrating this yell and, and just this joyous excitement that yes, this really is the king. And they're throwing their cloaks. And remember back in the day, it wasn't easy to, to buy clothes. Clothing was very expensive. You remember the story with the, where the guy gets robbed and, and the Good Samaritan helps him and he takes his clothes, right? Because clothes in the ancient world are expensive. So it's a sign of respect. It's very expensive. And they throw their cloaks down to be trampled by a young donkey with Jesus on top of it. In fact, there's an entire sermon here, I think. What are we allowing to be trampled to praise Jesus? Isn't that an interesting question? What are we allowing in our life to be trampled underfoot in order to praise Jesus? What are we throwing on the ground and say, okay, Lord, it's yours, and do with it as you will. And if it means a, a, a young colt, you know, a young colt donkey stomps on it, so it praises you, so be it. Whether it's our success or our fame or our fortune or our, our life, our career, our funds, whatever it might be, Lord, I'm going to lay it down so that you're praised. And, and if, you need, if you want to trample it, so be it. So we praise Jesus along with these disciples as the confirmed king. And Jesus is orchestrating everything here. And it's a celebration of of God's predicted plan in Jesus. And we know the rest, and we know what happens a few short days later, but that's all part of Jesus' plan as well. But we see here clearly Jesus presenting himself as the promised Messiah. Some accept, and of course we know, many reject, which leads to the death, burial, and resurrection. Let's keep going. Pharisees in the crowd, a lot of the religious leaders, they know what's going on. They know what Jesus is doing. And so some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And you can imagine there's a loud scene, people praising and throwing cloaks down and, and other gospels, palms down. And so Jesus tells them this, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I put on your outlines this, proclaim Jesus as the conclusive creator. And I love what Jesus says, hey, if my people don't praise me as their promised Messiah, 
if the rocks had voice, if the rocks had consciousness, they'd wake up and go, oh, yeah, it's Jesus. Of course, yell it, shout it. It's obviously Jesus. He's the creator. He's the sovereign. He's the Lord. He's the king. He's the one that's sovereign over even the rocks on the ground. It's kind of like two plus two is four, like biscuits and then gravy with it, like graham crackers, chocolate, and then most of us would say roasted marshmallows. They go together. The rocks, if they could, they would wake up and say, oh, yeah, Jesus, promised Messiah, King, Sovereign, Lord, Creator. Of course, that's conclusive. That's as obvious as two plus two is four. And so Jesus says, I tell you, if these folks kept quiet, the stones would cry out. So we put this together where we proclaim Jesus as the conclusive creator. We praise Jesus as the confirmed king. We present Jesus as the coming Messiah. And we got a question we got to ask, right? Do I publicly profess Jesus as king of kings? As the disciples presented Jesus, and Jesus very clearly, finally, after all this time in the gospel, he says, I am the Messiah, and many accepted, and many rejected. And if you're here and you're listening, and you've accepted, do I publicly profess that? Jesus, of course, conclusively, and it's been confirmed, right? And Jesus is the Messiah, of course he is. And I declare him to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the people in Jesus' day, they were joyfully praising God. And it says, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Of course, it's Jesus. And do I publicly profess that Jesus is King of Kings. He's the promised Messiah. It's been confirmed through all his miracles that he's done. It is conclusive. And if these rocks could wake up, they'd say the same thing. See, we choose and we celebrate God's predicted plan in Jesus. But the story goes on a little bit shorter section. It's kind of sad. We choose God's presence, presence peace in Jesus. And you think, was that kind of a typo? No, I meant to put it that way. We choose God's presence peace in Jesus. Remember, we celebrate God's predicted plan, but there's a peace that comes from the presence of Jesus. And remember, it's not just through Jesus, like he's the conduit. The peace actually resides in Jesus. Jesus is God's predicted plan. It's in him, not just through him. And God's presence is now here. The king of the kingdom is now in Jerusalem. His peace is with him, and he offers that. Even symbolically riding on this young colt, this young donkey, he offers peace. But he reflects on that, and Jesus has this sense of very compassionate sadness. And there's only two times directly in the Gospels that we know that Jesus very clearly cried. One is in John 11 at the scene with Lazarus, and the other one is right here. So he's traveled, he's lived the last uh, three years in his public ministry. He grew up you know, in Nazareth and, and, and Northern Galilee, and he ministered there and in Bethlehem. And, and now he's actually in Jerusalem. He's presenting himself as the promised, predicted Messiah. But he looks out, and he approaches Jerusalem, and he knows what's coming. And he saw the city, and he cries. Luke records that he wept over it, and he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. See, folks, don't we want that? I know I want that. Peace is elusive. Not just the peace of external, like military conflict, but the peace of God, resolution and connection with him, and peace really in our hearts, right? This conflict and this pain within us, and sometimes now amplified by anxiety and stress. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. You know, I put on your outlines this, open your eyes to peace through Jesus acceptance. See, Jesus is sad. He knows what's coming. He knows he has followers and many 
will accept, but by and large, he knows he's heading to rejection at the cross. And it's part of his plan, and he understands that. But he's so saddened compassionately by those that will choose to reject his peace. And it's the peace with God. It's this internal peace. I love what one of our recent studies through our small group said, that warrior, warrior peace of God's provision. We're outside is conflict, and there's anxiety producing things all around us. Yet God surrounds us in a warrior way with his peace and can protect us by the presence of Christ. Folks, we have an opportunity here. Because will it, when Jesus looks at us, will he say, oh, if only you'd accepted my peace. Or will he say, I am so glad. I am so joyous. I am so happy. Will we be a cause? Will you be a cause? For our Savior's joy when we respond in faith and when we accept. But Jesus realizes that many will not. And so he approaches Jerusalem and he weeps and he cries. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. And folks, that's a call to you and I. If you, even you, even me, would know what brings us peace. But for many, then and now, it is hidden from our eyes. And he goes on and it turns a corner and it gets a little dark. Because remember, Jesus is coming with grace. Jesus is coming in peace. But there will be a time when he comes in judgment on those horribly described horses, right, in Revelation with judgment and, and, and fire and pain. And Jesus predicts something for Jerusalem that's quite sad. And, and really what he predicts here is something that happened not too much further out from when Jesus describes it. In fact, just a few decades later, in AD 70, when Jerusalem is destroyed by Roman soldiers. And so Jesus says this, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. See, Jesus, and he always does this. He doesn't leave us any wiggle room. He says, I so compassionately want you to accept me. But may I remind you that I am on a donkey now, but I can also come on a horse. And he describes this physical judgment that's coming but really, it's, it's a reminder that when we choose to reject Jesus and we choose to exclude his presence, then Jesus excludes us from his mercy and grace. You know, it's a, his peace and his grace is offered freely. It's like a gift to which we need to respond and receive it. And so not only do we open our eyes to peace through Jesus' acceptance, but we open our eyes to judgment through Jesus' rejection. And, and, and there's a choice concerning Jesus. There's one of acceptance or there's one of rejection. And it's the difference between salvation and judgment. And in the case in history, it's the difference between Jerusalem as a city accepting him or this coming judgment a few dec decades later. But really, it's indicative of a choice between heaven and hell or to be brought in or to cast out. Jesus says, please, choose my presence, choose my peace. God's been working on this throughout history. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And Jesus says, here I am. Some accepted, many rejected. Key question in this section, the previous section, do I publicly profess, wow, say that seven times fast, do I publicly profess Jesus as King of Kings? In this section, do I publicly profess Jesus as Prince of Peace? And he wants to offer us his peace, the peace with God the Father. And we know the rest of the story through his death and the burial and the resurrection. He offers peace with God and he offers new life now and peace internally. And he offers us the peace of his protection and his provision throughout this life and in eternity. So do I profess in a loud way, in a joyous, not obnoxious, 
but in a loud, joyous way. Jesus, of course, yes, he's king of kings, and he's the prince of peace. You see, Jesus as a historical figure, well, okay, we, yeah, well, that's nice. Jesus as an inspirational motivator, you know, in these pithy sayings of his, that's, that's good. Jesus as a gifted teacher, yeah, he, he, we've seen all kinds of teaching, and Jesus is gifted. Jesus as a famous prophet, wow, you bet, and, and he's celebrated in, in a few different uh, religions as a famous prophet. But Jesus saying, no, that's, that's not it. Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, those others don't go far enough. You know, at the second coming, this is the first coming, the first advent. At the second advent, we see Jesus as described as the Lamb of God, our peace offering. And he's described as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we know what's coming. We know what happened there. And we're in that in between. We have the death, burial, and resurrection done. So this first coming is over. The second coming is yet to come. And he's celebrated here as the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace. He's going to be celebrated there as the King of Kings and the Lamb of God and the Prince of Peace. Why wait? Publicly, joyfully, wonderfully shout, Jesus, King of Kings and Prince of Peace. Father, we are so grateful for what you've done in Jesus Christ. And as Luke presents it, we're a little saddened because we know what happens in the space of a week. And we know that even some of the people that were shouting on that road through the Mount of Olives and down in, and then back up into Jerusalem, they ended up rejecting Jesus. But Father, for our part, we want to declare Jesus as the complete promised Messiah. It's obvious. He's the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace. And God... We see that confirmed in history and as close as our own heart when we accept and respond in faith. God, help us to see that the stakes are high. It's the difference between a judgment and, and peace with you. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between receiving you as the great peacemaker on that donkey or receiving you as the righteous warrior in judgment. Father, for my part, I'm so thankful. And I declare boldly and loudly. And Father, I join your people at Helvetia Community Church. King of kings, Lord of lords, Prince of peace, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Folks, go out this week. This week and publicly, whether it's social media or with family or with friends, kindly, compassionately, not obnoxiously, but boldly profess Jesus as your King of Kings and your Prince of Peace. God bless you. I love you.